Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the OutMarket.pro podcast. I'm pleased to have with me Tracy Mayo. She is the principal or one of the principals, I'll let her clarify, of Savvy Mortgage Lending uh, in the St. Petersburg, Florida area, and I'm sure beyond, and we'll get that from her too. Uh, full disclosure, um, Tracy ably uh, led me through the mortgage process to buy a new condo. And someday I'll show it to you, but today we'll just talk about the mortgage industry and changes uh, recent times and and back up a little bit, not, not into pre-Tracy times, but uh, just to talk about the mortgage industry uh, in general and those changes. Um, and I certainly have seen changes. When I last did my mortgage, and I shared this with Tracy, it was right before the Great Recession in 2007. And I called my bank, my local bank, and said, hey, I'd like to have a mortgage. And they said, well, we'll have it for you in a few days to just come down and sign it. I will do the closing. So the times, they are changing. And uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that. So welcome, Tracy. Glad to have you here with us on the podcast. Thank you for having me, Mark. So is it fair, and I've just been a casual observer of the industry as I am with most things, is it fair to say that we could take a look at some time blocks in terms of mortgage um, pre-Great Recession, uh, times leading up to that, then recession, the recession period and recovery, maybe no major changes till COVID, and then what we hope is post-COVID, the post-COVID era, or uh, notwithstanding or not including the days of the 18% mortgage. I don't know if you're old enough to remember that, but I, I remember them. Uh, I didn't participate, but, uh, but I remember them. So let's, we'll skip that part. Are those meaningful timeframes to talk about? They are, yeah. I mean, you had pre the recession, like you said, 2006, 2007, 2008, and then some changes went into effect in 2012, and then changes went into effect again in 2016, and then changes went into effect 2020 when we had COVID, um, and things have loosened up a little bit more since COVID. Um, they tightened up drastically, but yeah, I mean, there there are all these different um, times in our immediate most recent history that change the way things are done in the mortgage world and honestly it's an ever-changing ever-living entity anyway i mean mortgages is always changing guidelines change uh, new regulators come into into the you know the market or into the office and uh, and then they start putting other things in place so yeah things tighten up they loosen up as the economy does okay well and we don't want to dig so deeply that we'll lose uh, viewers, but um, if you'll sort of summarize those different periods and and what you saw as a mortgage lender and what what the clients would see going through that process. Yeah, so pre-2008, I mean, people could get a mortgage very easily. Like you said, you call up your neighborhood bank and they give you a, a mortgage and you're basically, just, as long as you had a good credit score, you could sign off on the document and get a mortgage. Um, you didn't have to income qualify. We had a lot of stated income options back then. Then 2012 came. We actually had a refi boom kind of thing because the rates went down and uh, the market was starting to improve after the recession. So the rates were coming down. So it got a little, uh, you know, a little busier again. Uh, 2012, things were starting to loosen back up and uh, they started developing programs like streamline refinances for government backed loans and things were just starting to loosen up again. And then some regulations came into place in 2016. Uh, we started tightening up again and then uh, COVID came and they really tightened up mainly for like uh, self-employed borrowers and investors and they wanted to make sure that uh, we weren't getting uh, we weren't doing too many refinances and taking equity out because the rates were really low uh, when the property values might change. And so they were starting to tighten tighten that up a little bit. 
and now they're starting to loosen things back up. So we, you know, we don't really have stated income programs anymore where you just tell me what you make. We have to actually verify that. Uh, we don't have um, just a, a handshake and a, a nod and a wink and an elbow, you know, to get a loan. You know, you really do have to qualify. And, you know, so it it is a little stricter in today's world. Yeah. Um, I heard somebody refer to the loans pre Great Recession as liar loans um, that uh, the banks and, and confirm whether this is true, that the banks didn't care if you could pay for it or not. They were they were counting on repossessing the properties and and selling them. Well, I don't know that they were counting on that, but they were they were taking the risk for sure. That's what ultimately happened, which caused the the demise. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, they they could be liar loans. They were we call them stated income. Uh, you know, if someone worked at McDonald's as a custodian, for example, they could tell us that they make a hundred thousand dollars a year, and we wouldn't question that. We we would take them at their word. And um, and then they came out with the ATR, which is ability to repay. So we had to prove that someone actually did have the ability to repay the mortgage. Um, what what has been the most um, fun period um, to do mortgages? Flush was it was it during COVID when people were just fighting over uh, over properties? I guess it can't be fun during COVID, but just let's just focus on the business part. When was the most fun during yeah. that period? Yeah, I mean, it's it's always fun to get somebody a low interest rate. And during COVID, we had low interest rates. I mean, we we had rates in the ones, 1.99%. And so, you know, that's always fun. But, you know, and we were very busy. And, and honestly, we probably had some of our best years during 2020 and 2021. However, you know, you don't really want to brag on that too much because people went through a really hard time during COVID. Um, you know, first of all, people lost their jobs, their livelihoods, their lives. And, you know, and then also, uh, you know, it was a hard market for buyers to get into because there wasn't enough inventory and we had a lot of buyers trying to buy and they couldn't buy. And they, the values just kept going up and up because lack of inventory, you know, it's economics 101, you know, uh, supply and demand. And so that was a very stressful time for buyers, but it was a great time for people who were refinancing. So I enjoyed it, honestly, because it, it was busy, 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 a little stressful, but busy. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, I enjoy when the first time home buyers can actually qualify and get a home. I really love my first timers. I like educating and that's part of what we do. So um, so business wise, 2020 was great. Uh, on the you know just you know partially great partially not for the buyers so yeah right i stayed out of that market that's when we first were interested yeah. and i just did not want to compete for 12 uh with 12 other people throwing cash at a at a house i did sell during that period uh a home so it was a it was actually at the peak of that local market in louisville so yeah. I feel really, really fortunate to be on that side of of people throwing cash at, at a mortgage. Um, the the process. Talk a little bit about the process, and let's let's say current times. And uh, a lot of it seems to be, you know, about verification. And I know underwriters have certain responsibilities. The federal government. Just just from what I was able to pick up from you, the federal government, Fannie Mae, um, Fred, is it Freddie Mac? Also, Freddie Mac, yep. That they set a lot of these guidelines. Um, talk about what what your requirements are, and you and, and let's also tell the audience, you know, what you do, where you fit into the process, because you're a mortgage broker. Let's yeah. let's educate about that process and. The diff I know I'm asking you a bunch of questions at one time. That's okay. But let's start there um, with with your role and the other players in that in that process. Let's bring some light to that. Yeah. So 
we are mortgage brokers, so we're kind of a middleman. But what that middleman uh, gets you, gets us the ability to do is to find the best program for people. We don't get paid for from the client for that. The real the lenders that we work with pay us. Uh, for bringing the loan to them. We work kind of like realtors do. You know, uh, you 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 get a realtor to help you buy a house and the seller of the home pays the realtor's commission for bringing the buyer to them. It's the same thing with a mortgage broker. We've got options that um, a loan originator that works for a bank doesn't necessarily have because they only have their bank's programs. We've got all these different lenders that we can work with and they're wholesale lenders. Um, so that's where we fit into it. So we're we're shopping around trying to find the best deal. Um, you know, as far as the guidelines go, the underwriting guidelines, um, yeah, I mean, the underwriters are tasked with um, protecting the interest of the lender that we we send the deal to. So uh, you know, if you're going conventional, then it's a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac guideline that the underwriters are tasked with ensuring that they've met. If you're going FHA, it's a HUD guideline. If you're going through VA loan, uh, the VA sets those guidelines. And there are certain requirements for each of these different loans. And, um, and as long as everything falls into those guidelines, then we can get an approval by the underwriter. Um, you know, you've got your vanilla borrowers, uh, which are W-2 people. Um, we're going to look at pay stubs. We're going to look at W-2s. That's how we're going to verify their income. We might do a verification of income or an, a verification of employment toward the end of the process to make sure that they're still working, uh, of course. And, um, and then, of course, we're going to look at asset statements to make sure that they've got the money for down payment and closing costs. That's a pretty easy loan. They kind of fly through underwriting. Uh, of course, the lender wants to make sure the house appraises and that the title is clear and uh, that the borrower has gotten insurance on the property to, to take effect on the closing date. So those are things that the lender is also going to require. But then you've got self-employed people where the guidelines are a little stricter because they're, it's not as easy to verify income for a self-employed person. You know, a self-employed person files taxes and has write-offs and deductions and uh, they may make seven figures, but they write off a lot of stuff and maybe they don't make seven figures at the end of the day. And so, you know, those are things that an underwriter then has to analyze their tax returns for an average of two years. So every every person is different on what has to be verified. And um, like I said, your vanilla W-2 people, employees of companies are nice and easy. A um, little more complicated when you get into other other uh, types of employment. It looked like there were precautions taken to make sure that grandma and ma don't give kids the down payment, um, that there was, there was a lot of focus on money transferred uh, in, in and out. Is that, is that what they're trying to protect against is some, uh, let's say young Youngish, youngish people who may not really be able to afford this house that are getting an influx of cash from somebody else, or, or does that disqualify? No, I mean gift money is allowed. I mean, if 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 um if a, if grandma wants to give money, maybe she wants to go ahead and give them their inheritance, and she gets to see them spend it while she's still living. Um, she can give the gift money to um, a, a grandchild or a child or, you know, parents can do the same to help them with the down payment and the closing cost. And with most of the loans, it can be 100% of what is needed um, can be gifted from a family member. But um, what, what they don't like to see is large deposits coming into a bank account that can't be sourced because it's all about sourcing uh, those those funds that are coming in there, it's to protect from money laundering, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So they want to make sure that all the money is sourceable. And so if they see large deposits coming in and it can't be sourced and there's not a legitimate reason for it, then the underwriter will do what's called backing it out. Um, so it doesn't mean that they're taking it out of their account, but they're taking it out of what they have as qualifiable assets. So that kind of gets backed out of what their actual balance is and what they'll actually need. 
So uh, yeah, it, as long as it's a family member, we can easily rectify that by getting a gift letter from the from the grandmother stating that she's gifted the money. If it's uh, a cash, uh, you know, just an influx of cash coming in, for example, maybe somebody is selling some furniture or something and they don't have a bill of sale, we may not be able to source that. So we may not be able to use it. Uh, it's up to the underwriter in, in a lot of cases for that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, what are, talk, talk a little bit about your business and the flow of the business and just being in this business. What's, what's it like? Mo most people, most people know somebody in the mortgage industry, I think, but I think the inner workings of it are probably pretty opaque to most people. What's it like to, to run a business? And, um, do you have a, you have a partner? Uh, in the business? How, how's your business structured? Yeah, we're structured. Um, yeah, we own the business and we, I love it. I love the lending business. I really do. Um, I, I, I'm, I love educating. I love making sure that people are getting into the right mortgage for their individual circumstances. I remember when I bought my first house, uh, you know, in the late eighties, early nineties, I knew nothing. And it freaked me out and I just signed a lot of documents and I had a mortgage payment and that's all I knew, but I didn't understand the process. So when I got into the industry, that was my, my main objective was to educate and make sure that people understood what they were doing, what they were, why they were going into certain loans. And, um, you know, the, the inner workings are, you know, it, it's convoluted, which is why it's kind of opaque. Like you said, I mean, people don't really, you know, it's kind of like a surgeon. Uh, you go to a surgeon and you just want the surgeon to perform the surgery, but I don't need you to tell me what you're going to do exactly. Just kind of give me an idea um, because I really don't want to know that you're going to stitch up the insides of me or something. You know, I really just just tell me what you're doing. Um, but, you know, it gets a little convoluted and it is complicated. And so it's hard for a lot of people to even digest it mentally. Um, so it, it, you know, but mainly we we take a loan. I mean, we take an application we run credit, we make sure that the client is gonna qualify, and then we try to figure out which loan is the best loan for them. How much money do they have to put down? What is their credit score? Uh, what is their debt to income ratio? All of those things dictate which loan they can go into. And so, you know, once we figure that out, then underwriting guidelines start start going into effect. And as long as we can meet those guidelines and, and everything is cleared, then we can get someone to closing. So it's, yeah, it could be a little convoluted though. Um, is the lowest rate always the best option for people? No, no, it's really not. Um, sometimes people think that it is and, and you get a lot of rate shoppers uh, that are just like, hey, I just want to know what your rate is. Well, I can give you a rate, but it's going to depend because there are a lot of things that drive that rate. But also, do you want to pay discount points? Because a lot of times getting the lowest rate means that you're paying discount points, which is an additional origination fee that is part of your closing cost. So, uh, you know, if you want the lowest rate, you might have to pay for it. Um, and if you've got the money to do so and it makes sense, then, then do it all day long. Um, if you don't have the extra money, then you might not want to focus so much on trying to get the lowest rate you can get. You want to get the best rate you can get with the lowest fees. And so that's what we strive to do. And then if someone chooses to buy the rate down, you know, we kind of walk them through how to do that and what they're doing and whether it makes sense. Because again, what I look at is how much is it going to cost to get that discounted rate? And how much is it going to save you? And how much is it going to save you in the short term and the long term? And let's back into it and make sure that it's going to make sense. And how long is it going to take for you to recoup that upfront cost? And, you know, there's all those things that we have to look at. How long are you going to keep planning to keep the house, that sort of thing? And we exactly we did that, um, brought it down. We were we were at probably at peak rates to date. Well, yeah, in recent times. Yeah. Uh, and we're able to spend a reasonable amount of money to get a significant uh, reduction in rates that made sense long term and short term. Yeah. Uh, has that always been a, an option for people to be able it's to always, buy a rate? 
Yeah, I'm sorry. It, yeah, it's always an option. Um, you don't hear about it a lot when you're in a, a normal rate market or a low rate market like we have been over the last, you know, you know, COVID era. era. Um, but it's always an option to buy the rate down. You just don't see a lot of people trying to trying to discuss it because you don't need to because the rates are already they're normal and people are happy with them. It's when you start getting into those five, six, sevens, eights that people start thinking, hey, how do I get this rate lower? Well, here's what it's going to cost you. And and I've done it too. I've bought my rate down. Um, I did a refi for someone and we actually she needed to take some equity out of her home. So she was increasing her mortgage balance. And the rate was slightly higher than it had been. So what we did, she had enough equity in her home that we actually bought the rate down and we kept her mortgage payment exactly where it was before she increased her mortgage balance to take that equity out just by buying the rate down a little bit. So sometimes, I mean, it, it sometimes it makes sense, but again, it's got to be a long-term plan. And as a certified mortgage planning specialist on the on my other side, um, that's what I do. I look at, okay, does it make sense to do this? Um, I, you know, let's let's talk this through. And um, so that's yeah, it's it's not unusual to do it, but it's it's always been an option. People just don't take advantage of it. And when they were down at one point nine nine percent, you're probably not going to pay. Although, if you can remember back that far. Um, were you able to spend a reasonable amount of money and get a 1%? No, 1.99 was the lowest rate that I saw from any of my lenders. So that was going to be the lowest rate you could get. And you were already probably paying a little bit of discount point to get it. The normal rate was coming in at about 2.5%, 2.625%. So that's what we call the par rate. So if you were buying the rate down, that's what I, that was 1.99. I didn't see a lender go below that. Okay. What are the rates, average rates now? And there's probably a, a, a benchmark rate that, that you look at. Uh, what are they and what's it been just in the last, uh, I mean, they've gone up, they've doubled in the last year, right? Yeah, pretty much because they went, yeah, they went from the threes to the, to the sixes and sevens, you know, so, I mean, if you're like just looking at a, um, a, a primary purchase of a home and if you're putting 20% down, you're looking at somewhere in the mid to upper fives, maybe the, depending on credit score, maybe to the low sixes, if you're buying an investment property, investment rates are always slightly higher than primary purchase rates. So uh, they're usually in the sevens, um, depending on the loan program to, uh, to the eights. Um, yeah, so they're, they're a little bit on the high side right now, but I would say our average rate right now for perfect credit, um, you know, is gonna come in the, the low sixes, um, buying it down to the mid fives maybe. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so they've come down recently. Um, they did. There, there were some, and maybe have always been some very creative options. Seems like there were a lot more of them just off top of mind back pre pre great recession where you could put much less down 5% down. Um, and, uh, a lot of temporary ARMs or arms, if that's what they're called. Yeah. Um, are there still those, creative options for people in unique situations to say that don't have a lot of down payment or for investment uh, and don't want to put a lot down. What are some of the more creative outliers that are out there? Well, pr to pre-recession, I mean, you could actually do 100% financing, um, sometimes 110% financing, and you could roll your closing cost into the loan. It was crazy. Um, now you cannot roll closing cost into a purchase. You can roll them into a refinance if you've got the equity to do so. Um, the the uh, purchase though, now in today's world, if you're a first time home buyer, you can get in with as little as 3% down. Um, if you're not a first time home buyer, you can get in with 5% down on a conventional which is nice. Um, you don't have to put that 20% down. You do have that private mortgage insurance or PMI that you have to pay. There are arms out there, adjustable rate mortgages, where um, you are paying some uh, 
you know, I mean, you're taking a, a risk on future rates, but you are maybe getting a slightly lower rate as an adjustable than you would have the fixed. Uh, it just depends on the market and the lender. But uh, generally, I have seen the arms are pretty much with the 30 year fix. So, you know, I usually recommend, look, if, if it's the same, you might as well go with the fixed and then, you know, you're good versus taking that risk. Uh, but of course, if you take the arm risk, you could benefit. The rates could come down, you know, and then you get a slightly better rate. But uh, we do have a 1% down program too for first time home buyers with low income qualifying. Uh, you still have to qualify, but uh, you know, if you fall be beneath a certain uh, income level and you qualify, you can get in with 1% and the lender will give them 2% back to be 3% down. But um, yeah, they. I would say most lenders have gotten a little stricter with the amount of money that you have to put down. And even the non-income qualifying options that we do have, the rates are higher, but you still have to put a good bit of money down. So the lenders are, are you know, limiting their risk by making you put a little skin in the game. Mm -hmm. Which is smart. And yeah. It was it was those excesses that led to the mortgage crisis back in 07. Exactly. I mean, that's what happened. People were uh, they were upside down. They were underwater on their mortgages because they had financed 100 percent or 110 percent. And then the values came down because the market was crashing as around us. And, um, you know, so now they owed more. And then uh, the lenders uh, came out with programs that were um, to help those people refinance to get into a better rate at that point. And yeah, so it yeah, it can get convoluted and again, complicated when when you've got things like that that have happened. So. I think the lenders have gotten smart about that. So things have slowed down since last year. Um, I think they were slowing down towards the fall of last year. Um, I don't remember exactly. But um, and then I think there's a, a lack of inventory because people that are in those two, three, four percent mortgages don't have much desire to sell because if they get into something else, they're going to be paying paying more, especially in the twos and threes. Um, what do you see happening? Are, are things loosening up um, from when the rates first started to jump up? What what's and I know you're not you hear peripherally about what's going on in the real estate market, but what do you, what do you see happening in this period? Yeah, I mean, I think the lack of inventory is a twofold issue. I mean, they do have good low rates, so they don't want to get into a double double that rate. Um, they they also know that they might sell their house at a price point, but then where are they going to go? Because now the values are higher, and they're probably better off staying in their home that they already have a low mortgage payment for, and you know they might not find a. a a comparable home for less than what they're getting ready to sell it for you know so so generally people are staying because of that but what i am seeing on the periphery is that people are buying again uh, we had we've got four people that went under contract in the last week um, on purchases which is huge because um, i think people are getting a little more used to the interest rates you know, I mean, that's what it that's what it comes down to is, you know, people got a false sense of what rates were because of COVID. And those were those rates really, in in my personal opinion, should have never been that low. Um, and so it gave it gave everyone a shock when the rates went up so fast and so high, uh, relatively speaking based on what they had just recently seen. And, you know, people have short memories and uh, they don't they don't remember that, you know, it wasn't just 10 years ago, maybe 15, that you were you were in those bigger rates anyway. You know, so people people forget that. They just forget that altogether and um, they they just focus on the the now. And uh, but I think people are now seeing that, OK, well, these rates aren't so bad. We can make it work. Um, these are normalized rates and honestly, a normal rate in, in again, in my personal opinion, should be in the mid to upper mid fours to to mid fives. Those are good, solid, normal, healthy economic rates. Um, it's when they're lower that it's it's not a healthy economy, which we saw in COVID. 
Um, and when they're higher, when it's not a healthy economy like we're seeing right now, it's it's going to settle back down. I, I don't think we'll ever get back to the twos. So, um, you know, I don't think that we should. So. And <clears throat> fortunately, people have short memories now, so they're not they're starting to forget that it was in the twos and threes. Yeah. Um, and and now it's getting normal. And uh, people as old as I am remember 16, 18 percent back in the 80s. Um, yeah. Well, that's what I had. I had a 13 percent rate. And when it and I had an adjustable rate and my adjustable went down three times while I had that mortgage and I was down to like eight or nine percent at one point before I sold my condo. And um, but I thought I had like hit the lottery when I went from 13 to single digit rates. It's like, oh, my gosh, uh, because my my payment went down drastically and it was amazing. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, the fact that we had those low rates is what's causing the banking crisis, that the broader banking crisis that we're having. Yeah. I hope we can keep a lid on it, which they seem to be at the moment, although we had a big buyout this weekend with Chase and First Republic. Yeah. But um, uh, there looks to be, and I, I was taking a look at the underlying issues, which I try to do, that there are a lot of banks that have, um, uh, uh, I don't know if it's treasury notes, but whatever whatever they buy, in the ones and one and a half percent and they are certainly they can't sell them um so we're we still could be in a uh in a crisis and it's just bubbling and not not erupting yet yeah let's talk about refis we really haven't talked about that um there i believe there's a rule of thumb on reduction in rates but talk about when people should consider refinancing? Well, I mean, refinancing works differently for di different people. I mean, most people think of refinancing when they want to get a lower interest rate. But, um, you know, so for example, someone buys a house today and the rate is 6% and then the rates go down to 4.5% in two years. They, they definitely should consider refinancing. Um, you know, it depends on how long you're going to keep the home. I mean, if you're if you're only going to keep the house for another year, then it may not make sense to refinance because there are a lot of closing costs that go into that. And all you're doing is rolling those costs into your mortgage or you're paying it out of pocket at the at the closing table. So, again, you've got to make sure that you're going to recoup that that cost, that it makes sense. Um, but that's when most people think of refinancing. The other options for refinancing would be a couple of things. Uh, if you need to take some equity out to do a home improvement, even if it means that the rate goes up uh, or that the rate stays the same. Um, but if you really need the equity, you need the equity to do what you're trying to do. So it makes sense in some cases to do that. Um, you can also look at refinancing to pay off some high interest debt. For example, someone could have $30,000 in credit card debt. Maybe they had an issue and they're paying 18% in, in credit card interest. It makes sense, even if your rate goes up, to, to do that. Um, then there's also home equity lines of credit that you can do or second mortgages that you can do where you're not increasing the rate on your entire mortgage. You're only having the rate based on what you're taking out. So, you know, there are all kinds of reasons to refinance, and it doesn't always mean that it has to be that rule of thumb of where the rate is at least 1% lower, which used to be the reason that you would do it. There's also the reason, I forgot about this option, to get out of one loan into another. So if someone's in an FHA loan, for example, and they're paying private mortgage insurance for the life of the loan, it might make sense to refinance out of that program into a conventional loan so that the PMI goes away. Uh, because it will drop off organically after you reach 20% equity. And maybe in an FHA loan, you've already got that equity. So the only way to get rid of that private mortgage insurance is to go into a conventional loan. Um, you know, so there, there are all, all kinds of different reasons for doing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, divorce. And uh, divorce. Wanting, wanting to yeah. pay off your former yeah. spouse, somebody's buy, buying it out. 
Exactly. And that's a that's a very legitimate reason. I literally just went through one myself and I did not refinance. We ended up selling our house, but there was there was that thought of doing that um, because that's the only way that you can pay someone their equity is to refinance the home or sell it. And um, and of course, your spouse is entitled in, in most cases to half of that equity. So, yeah, that is a legitimate reason to do it. Mm -hmm. Um. Let's let's do as we're wrapping up, starting to wrap up, wrap up here. Let's do some general education. You, I'm sure you've got. Let's let's put your soapbox under you uh, okay. in a good way, and um, uh, tell people, tell the audience uh, the types of things that you like to inform your clients about. Um, yeah, so one of my big education moments with with um, just about every client that I've ever talked to is to talk about homesteading, uh, because, you know, we're licensed in multiple states. Uh, we're licensed in Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and Pennsylvania, but uh, Florida is, is what we call a homestead state, and that's, you know, that's where we're based, and so I like to educate people because homesteading uh, definitely helps them understand property taxes. So I spend a lot of time trying to educate people on why taxes are what they are on a home currently and what they will be estimated to be on, you know, once you buy it, once the, the new person buys the home, because they're going to increase, they're going to reassess. And so I like to explain that homesteading because that explains why the rates, the, the, the tax rates go up so much higher on a, on a new uh, purchase. Um, I also like to talk about flood zone and insurance. Even though I'm not an insurance girl, I like to make sure that people understand that if you're in a flood zone, we've got to factor in some flood insurance into this. And um, so I'm going to give you some, some insurance people to talk to because they are better at educating for that. And, and we do like educating. So we like trying to make sure that the client totally understands it. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's a little, it's a lot of information coming at a, at a new client when we're having these conversations and they're not, they're not taking it all in. Um, so, you know, we, we have to get a little better maybe at, you know, educating at the beginning and then maybe giving a reminder education little moment throughout the process and then even after, uh, which is why, you know, I like to add people into my, my CRM, which is my, my database to educate them throughout the next couple of years because uh, there's always something new coming out that people need to be educated about. Um, I have property in Indiana as well. And my partner on the farm was mentioning that there is a homestead exemption or, or maybe it's related to age that after 65, you can get a discount. Is What is it in Florida? Um, and when should somebody take a look at that? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I think if you're looking to buy a house, you should start looking at the homestead exemptions. You don't get to apply for the homestead exemptions until you own the home. But there are a lot of a lot of exemptions in Florida. Uh, you've got age related. You've got homestead related, which means that you're living in the home as your primary home. You've got um, widow exemptions. You've got veteran exemptions, disability exemptions. Um, there, there are just so many exemptions. And if you go to your county website, uh, we call it in Florida, the county uh, property appraiser site. So if you go to whatever county your, your home is in, you can go to that, that site and they usually have a list of the exemptions that you can apply for. And when you apply for it, you are applying for the next tax year. So generally in Florida, if you're not in your home by January 1st of the tax year, so for example, January 1st of 2023, you don't get any exemptions for 2023, but you can apply in 2023 as long as you own your home and it will take effect in 2024. Okay, and is there sufficient information on the website? Can you speak to a person at the appraiser's office? You can, um, you can go in directly to the county property appraiser site and do it uh, and they'll walk you through it. But generally um, on just about every website, there is a link for you to do that application. And it's pretty self-explanatory. I mean, I've done them on multiple homes that I've, I've lived in here and I've always done it online because it's just very easy to do. They, they ask you a lot of questions and you have to confirm some identity 
questions. Um, and then, you know, you've got to update your driver's license and update your car registration to prove if you're applying for homestead to prove that you are homesteaded. So, you know, there are all these things, but it's pretty easy process to do. Okay. So somebody buying a new home um, should look into that as soon as they uh, take possession of the home. Yeah, Especially for sure. Towards the end of the year. Yeah, for sure. And they should definitely be applying as soon as they can, as soon as they own their home. You've got technically until uh, I think February 28th of the tax year uh, to apply but you have to have owned the home by January 1st of that year, but they give you that, you know, to the end of February to apply. But I always recommend as soon as you've closed on your home and the deed has been recorded, go apply for it because you'll forget. And if you forget, they don't backdate it. If you forget and you miss that deadline, you miss the deadline and you mm -hmm. won't get your exemption until the following year. But again, I do tend to recommend that people look at those exemptions before they close on their home so that they understand what their estimated property taxes are going to reassess to because there's a tax estimator link on most of the county websites as well where you can go and look at what somebody else is currently paying on that that house and what your tax bill will ultimately be once mm -hmm. it reassesses and on the insurance homeowners insurance you know when when you're applying for it it's in the middle of this I'll, I'll just say it, middle of this shit storm with yeah. everything's going on. So um, it's hard. And there were dramatic differences in pricing. Um, and I started with a lower price. And but I want to make sure that there's proper coverage. Will your I guess your insurance agent has every reason to have your best interest in heart at heart and to be able to tell you and re recommend hey, you need this coverage, this is optional. Do you, are there any guidelines that you recommend on percentage of value, um, any recommendations that you have for new homeowners? No, I mean, because you, you really do have to trust your insurance agent, just like you have to trust your mortgage person or your realtor or, you know, your home inspector. You have to have trust in them and feel comfortable with them. Um, I will say that I have seen that a lot of insurance, not a lot, I have seen insurance agents where they have over-insured a property um, or they've under-insured a property. And, for the, you know, so you may not be uh, perfectly covered the way that you want to, or you may have a higher deductible than you really want. Uh, luckily, lending guidelines require certain things. So they require that the uh, the deductible cannot be above a certain percentage of the, the value of the home because they don't want you to be stuck not being able to cover that deductible if something happens. They want you to be able to pay it. They also want to make sure that you've got replacement cost value built into your, your policy. But, you know, you you are kind of rushed to make a decision when you're buying a home. Like you said, you're in the middle of that shit show and you're just trying to find the best policy for whatever's going to get you to closing and and have the best deal. But there's nothing that says that you can't go and start shopping for insurance after you close. Go and do some more due diligence, do some homework, uh, talk to more agents, maybe look at different policies. The only requirement is that if you do have a mortgage, um, you're you're going to need to notify your lender, uh, the servicer of your mortgage, that you're changing the insurance policy, and then they're going they're going to need to do some some things with your insurance agent, and your insurance agent knows what to do uh, to make sure that they're listed as the uh, you know the the um, mortgage mortgagee. They've got the mortgagee clause on there. So they just want to make sure of that. And then you can cancel your existing policy once you have a new one in place and they'll give you a refund for what it has not been used of your policy. So it's a good, good idea to shop it around anytime. But I usually say at least once a year, you know, start talking to other insurance agents and, you know, shop it around a little bit. Um, on the general education topic uh, with mortgages or anything else, do you have other um, uh, other issues that are big for you when you're educating your clients that you want to share? Can you elaborate just a little bit more? Yeah, actually, I'm, it's open ended because I just wanted to just be sure that we're covering everything that yeah. 
that you think is important for new home buyers or yeah 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 i got it um so yeah so i mean i think it's just important to understand the property taxes i think it's important to understand interest rates and programs and what those programs require and i think that it's it's just really important for people again to feel comfortable with the person that they're working with and know that most of us are there uh, and want to be there for the for the rest of their lives for the rest of that that client's life um, i like to say i want to be your mortgage broker for life because you know you're going to have questions in a year or two years or you're going to get some sort of an escrow shortage or something along the way because taxes and insurance increase over time and at some point you're not going to have enough being collected because the the lender now needs to raise your your mortgage payment up because your taxes and insurance might be escrowed and so you're going to have questions along the way so i like to say i'm here if you've got a question, no question is a dumb question. No question uh, is ever a bother to me. Even if we never do another deal together, I want to know. I want you to know uh, that I'm always here to answer questions and and to help you through that process. So, I mean, that's just one of the big things for me is that you know I'm here to help you through the process. I'm here to educate you as you need to be, especially first timers because you know they're getting into it. They don't know what they don't know until they until they're faced with it. So. Should there be a course for young people, first sure. time home buyers? Um, yeah. maybe, and maybe along the lines of this and credit, how to maintain credit, because there are, we didn't really even talk about that with people with bad credit, not able to buy a home, but credit yeah. checking accounts, all those sorts of financial literacy that I don't think kids are getting. There used to be a high school class with that sort of thing. Yeah, um, I mean, I didn't get a high school class. I wish there had been. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I think it's important to take some sort of finance class um, or, you know, just a, a basic, uh, you know, kind of class. Dave Ramsey is is great. Um, you know, he he's really good at helping people understand how to budget and and I think it it never would hurt to go to a, like a community college and just take some sort of a budgeting financial class. Um, credit for sure. People are afraid of credit. They don't understand credit. And a lot of people don't like to use credit because they're afraid of it or their parents said, you know, don't get a credit card because maybe their parents had a really bad experience with it. But, you know, you have to have credit and uh, to 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 navigate in today's world, you really do. So um, I think that learning how to use credit responsibly uh, will keep your credit scores up and then you, learning to budget will help you figure out how to buy a house. So tell us again, what states you are licensed in and talk about your business and or as far as how people can contact you. Uh, give us all that as we're wrapping up. Yeah, so we're licensed in Florida. Georgia, South Carolina, and Pennsylvania. So um, we we do mortgages all over those states. Uh, we're not limited to just a, a regional area. It's it's a state license. Um, we're savvy mortgage lending. We are located uh, physically in St. Petersburg, Florida, um, so on the West Coast. And we um, you can contact us by going to the website, which is SavvyMortgage.com, and it has two V's in it. Um, and or 727-877-5684 is our office number. Someone will always answer that nine to five. You can text that number as well after hours or on the weekends. And what about uh, best email address? Is there a general info? We do. We've got team at SavvyMortgage.com. And that goes to all of us so that uh, it's not just going to one person. It goes to all of us in case uh, one or two or three of us are out of the office. Somebody's always getting it. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. This is, you've been a wealth of information and I, and I knew that you would be from, you. Uh, from knowing you. Uh, so thanks for that. And hopefully we've educated some people on some issues that they hadn't thought about and can help them make a better decision. So thanks a lot for, for being on the podcast. Well, thank you for having me, Mark. It was great. Um, you, you, you do a great job of asking questions and I appreciate it. Well, thank you. All right. So, uh, you know what, now that I'm looking at myself, um, 
I've got different lighting and a different setting uh, because we're in the process of moving into that house that uh, Tracy helped us finance. So I look a little green, but I'm not feeling bad. I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I definitely have a green tent with me today. So I, I'm all right. But uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, we're usually uh, doing a new podcast every week, uh, interviewing people that are doing interesting things. We don't miss the one with the caricature artist uh, who actually did a caricature of me in the middle of the podcast. Uh, so go to outmarket.pro, look at our blog section, and you'll see a bunch of different podcasts. And also you can uh, sign up on YouTube and subscribe. And be sure to hit that notification bell because that will alert you when new ones come out. So Tracy, again, thank you so much. And um, right. I'll look, look forward to working with you in the future. And everybody else, we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks.